Okay, let's get started now. Um, thanks for everybody for joining. Uh, welcome to the CRR event today. We appreciate everybody joining us for our discussion. I'm Matt Pietrowski with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CRR Consortium, along with Aid Environment and Profundo. CRR provides sustainability risk analysis for investors in soft commodities. Our focus today will be on the global palm oil spot market. In recent years, the palm oil industry has seen considerable sustainability gains as suppliers non-comply with, with NDPE policies have, increasing, have been increasingly excluded from supply chains. However, these gains have been undermined at times when non-compliant suppliers enter supply chains via spot purchases. Yet very little is known about the palm oil spot market. Today, we'll be discussing how the palm oil spot market works, why some companies trade in the spot market, and how non-compliant suppliers use it to circumvent the NDPE market. A few housekeeping issues before we move forward. Everyone in the audience is on mute, but if you have any questions, you can type your questions into the Q&A function, and we will aim to answer after our main presentation. And we'll also put an archive recording of the event on our website in the coming days. And now I'd like to hand it over to Chris Wiggs of Aid Environment, the main author of our recent report on the palm oil spot market. Thanks, Matt. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, so as, uh, as Matt said, I'm going to talk today about the, the spot market and, and how the spot market works and the impact it's having on NDP compliance. So just to start, as, as everybody I'm sure knows, the palm oil industry in the last few years has completely transformed with the proliferation of these no deforestation, no peat, no exploitation policies. Um, they were first adopted in 2013, and they've now um, come to dominate the market. Um, key to their success has been that they don't just apply to a company's own concessions and own operations. They apply to all third-party suppliers. And what was so significant about them being adopted predominantly by the midstream um, portion of the palm oil industry, the traders and the refiners, is that because the way the palm oil market is sort of is structured where you have thousands of growers, thousands of consumer goods companies and manufacturers, but comparatively few trader refiners. By these trader refiners adopting sustainable sourcing policies, they were able to have such a huge knock on effect um, throughout the entire industry because so much palm oil is going through these, these um, refineries owned by these comparatively few companies. Um, most refining capacity takes place in Indonesia and Malaysia. And Chain Reaction Research um, did an analysis recently that um, shows that 83% of refining capacity in those countries is covered by an NDP policy, an NDP sourcing policy. So you can just see from those figures that the industry has completely been transformed. However, when you look at how much of the refining industry is covered by effective implementation, it falls to around 78%. And we know that deforestation in palm oil is still entering supply chains covered by NDP policies. So there are several reasons for that. Some of the ones that we have identified are you know, weak and inconsistent implementation of policies. Um, sometimes refiners are just not implementing their policies. Sometimes a deforestation linked grower is um, being excluded by one trader refiner but remains in the supply chain of another, even though the policies of those traders are basically identical. Um, you have what we refer to as the leakage market, which is the is just when a refiner or a company is not covered by an NDP um, policy and they're still buying deforestation linked palm oil. You have these opaque corporate structures, which um, CRR refers to as shadow companies. Um, and that's just when um, it appears that a company has attempted to hide a problematic concession or the, the corporate structure of a company is, is kind of murky, maybe registered in a secrecy jurisdiction. And what that does is it makes it very difficult for companies to apply policies at group level because you don't really know what the group is. Um, and sometimes you'll find that if you can't apply at group level, a concession or a mill will still be in a supply chain, even though the, the buyer thinks they've suspended that company. Um, you also have end user markets that do not set sustainability criteria, um, India, China, 
uh, obvious examples. And that provides a market for deforestation linked palm oil. You also have this thing called the spot market, which we have identified um, as a way that deforestation linked companies can still enter NDP supply chain. And that's what CRR has been looking into, and that's what I want to explain a bit about today. Uh, next slide. So before I sort of explain what the spot market is and how it functions, I just want to give a bit of background about why these NDP policies were so key in the industry and why they've had such a big impact. Um, they're applied, as I said, to third party suppliers. And the whole rationale behind it is that buyers who have these policies will engage with their suppliers and they will encourage NDP policy compliance with the threat of supply chain suspension or exclusion if they don't comply. Um, so if a company, if a buyer is purchasing from a company and that supplier is clearing forest, you engage with them, you try and get them to adopt the high carbon stock or high conservation value framework that makes up NDPE, or you get them to do a stock work order or some sort of compensation work. Those sorts of relationships and that sort of pressure is most commonly applied when there is like a long-term contract or a contractual relationship governing governing that sort of uh, those transactions um, long-term contracts allow buyers to set conditions of trade often ndp companies will um, you know demand concession maps or certain requirements before they um, enter into a long-term contract and they will have a clause in that contract that the buyer can suspend suppliers if they fail to comply with ndp standards and that has using that sort of purchasing power and that economic pressure has is what has encouraged a lot of growers to um, comply with NDP and adopt their own policies and stop deforesting. Um, and it's been really, really influential. And we have so many examples in the industry of of growers that have stopped deforestation in areas of forest that have been conserved because of pressure applied by the buyers. One thing that is quite important. Um, is that engagement between a grower and a buyer will almost always only occur with the direct buyer. You will often see, particularly when you look at um, these supply chains, that there's a lot of indirect purchases and you'll see downstream companies being pressured about who they are buying from. Um, if a supply comes into a supply chain indirectly, that buyer will very rarely engage with the source like the mill or the concession that sort of engagement will only come from the direct buyer and if a downstream buyer is buying indirectly they will usually only engage with their tier one supplier um, it's a little bit confusing but i hope that's sort of clear that when we talk about engagement it's with the direct buyer from the mill or the concession uh, next slide So what is the spot market? The spot market refers to transactions that take place outside of long-term contracts. They're usually one-off transactions made very quickly. Um, suppliers usually use the spot market to get rid of surplus stock and buyers um, use the spot market to plug shortfalls in capacity. Um, that's at, at its most simple, that's how it works. And it's usually, it operates outside of long-term contracts. Um, the spot market differs from the futures market. You will often, the terms are not used interchangeably, but when you hear about the spot market, you will also hear about the futures market at the same time. They are different things. The spot market, and as I'm talking about it today, is about purchasing the physical product, the physical palm oil. The futures market is, it refers to permits or contracts or paper um, that you're sort of setting setting up, you're buying a contract, but it's for a future delivery of palm oil. What we're talking about today is these um, one-off purchases of physical oil. And it's a market that not a huge amount is known about. It's, it's not particularly transparent. And when you're talking to people within the palm oil industry, um, it's quite clear that we don't really know, particularly people in sustainability don't always know how the spot market works. Um, and that's what CRR have wanted to sort of shed a bit of light on by doing this um, investigation. Uh, next slide. So if you're working in palm oil, if you read sort of the documents um, that palm oil companies publish, annual reports, financial statements, 
you will see reference from time to time to the spot market. Um, some examples I've just included here are um, back, like back with Sumatra Plantation, an Indonesian grower. In that annual report, they, they state that they are targeting the spot market locally and, um, and um, export markets. Um, in the annual report of Sawat Sambamas Sarana, they stated that they were um, using a sales system that is based on spot and they negotiate the delivery terms on each sale. Um, a credit um, report on the Malaysian palm oil grower Genting says that the bulk of its palm oil on the spot market, um, they're selling the bulk of their palm oil on the spot market. And those two companies, Sawat Sambamas Sarana and Genting, are quite noteworthy because they're, we know quite a lot about them and the period that they were buying spot purchase or selling on the spot market um, coincide with when they had been suspended from the NDP long-term contract market. Uh, next slide. So one of the biggest, one of the companies that most people will be aware of is Syme Darby. They're a big um, grower. They're also a trader refiner. Um, they have an NDP policy um, that they apply. Um, if you look at their website, you can see their policy, their sustainability reports. They have a grievance list which has 64 cases. Um, and they are working you know, to, to screen their supply chain, work with um, suppliers to adopt NDPE. Some of their, the cases on their grievance list, they state have entered their supply chain via spot purchases. Between 2017 and 2027 out of the 64 have entered their supply chain via spot purchases. And one of the ones that um, was quite high profile for them last year was the one that I've highlighted on the screen. It's Saraswanti Group or PT Saraswanti Utama. They're an Indonesian grower that is, um, has a, about 10,000 hectares of concessions in West Kalimantan, a lot of primary forest, orangutan habitat. Um, and that company has been clearing forest and they've been um, engaged, well, they were engaged by NDP companies, but eventually suspended because they weren't, they weren't willing to be compliant. And uh, a quite high profile um, forestry website in Indonesia was covering this case and noticed that Sime Darby were buying from them. And Sime Darby released a statement in response and said, yes, we're buying from them, but it was actually just a spot purchase. We don't really have a relationship with this company and we, have, we will try not to, to buy from them again. And that sort of piqued our interest because you had an example of, of a quite proactive palm oil buyer that does have a policy, it's very transparent, but is getting non no, deforestation linked palm oil entering their supply chain via spot purchases. Uh, next slide. So just looking at like Syme Darby's cases, some of the other cases of spot purchases that we had been able to find, we did some investigation and we spoke to a number of traders in the palm oil industry and sort of other stakeholders. And we tried to sort of work out like, why do people buy on the spot market? Um, is it like a, a business strategy? Like what are the volumes that people are trading and just sort of how it works? Um, the most, <laughs> the thing I have to say, first of all, is that it's very, very difficult to find information about the spot market. There's very, very little, there's no information on volumes and people are not willing to give that information usually. Um, often the information that we were told talking to people in the industry was contradictory, which implies that even in, within the companies, it's not always clear how it works. Um, I imagine it um, varies a lot depending on geographical location as well. And I um, um, also want to make clear that I'm based in Indonesia and I was talking to companies predominantly in Indonesia and Malaysia, and it might be very different in other geographical locations. Um, but all the evidence indicates spot transactions are opportunistic rather than a preferred business strategy. That was what was told to us and, and, and what it looks like. People prefer the, um, the stability and reliability of long-term contracts. The cases of Genting and SSMS are quite interesting because um, 
Genting was suspended by lots of companies a few years ago um, because of an RSPO complaint about new planting procedure violation. And that time period, 2014, coincides with when the last evidence of them using the spot market. Um, since then, they have become NDP compliant. They sell to almost all major traders, um, which you know implies that they're, they have a long-term contract business model that they've moved away from the spot market. Um, SSMS as well, their last reference to the spot market was 2015. Since then, that was when they had been suspended actually for a lot of um, deforestation and also an RSPO complaint. Um, and since then, they have established their own refinery owned by a related party. So again, it looks like they have moved away from a sort of spot market business model. And I'm, you know, we're assuming that that's because they, they preferred a different business model that perhaps offered more stability. However, we do know that for some companies, the spot market can be a viable business model um, for suppliers, even if for the buyer, it's not always materially significant. Um, and there's one example I want to show you on the, the next slide, please. So this is um, Palmer Sarasi, is an Indonesian grower that many people might be familiar with. They're based in East Kalimantan, we've got concessions, and they've been clearing forest for the last few years, um, about 6,500 hectares um, since January 2016. They've been engaged by a lot of the NDP buyers. They've been largely suspended by the NDP market. Um, in the first quarter of 2020, their financial statement um, revealed that their two biggest buyers were Louis Dreyfus Company, Palm Oil Trader, and Syme Darby. Syme Darby accounted for 31.61% of revenue and Louis Dreyfus 45.97%. If you look at um, Louis Dreyfus's grievance list, there's a lot of information about their interaction with um, engagement with Palmer Sarasi. They've been working with them to implement a stop work order, trying to. They've been working with them to get them to adopt HCS. There's been a lot of follow up. Um, so it's likely that they have a long term contract you know, relationship with Palmer Sarasi. I approached Sime Darby and they confirmed that um, they'd only bought two spot purchases from Palmer Sarasi at the beginning of this year. So just two spot purchases, you know, purchases that were materially not that significant to Sime Darby in terms of their annual volumes were enough to provide Palmer Sarasi with 31% of their revenue, which is obviously quite significant. Um, next slide. So we have examples of the spot market facilitating access to the NDP market for companies that are linked to deforestation. We don't know a huge amount about it, but we know that it is a risk. Um, and so we started looking into to how, how it works, um, sort of the logistics of the spot market. Um, we had planned to do some field investigations, like go to the ports and the the markets which we were not obviously able to do because of um, the COVID-19 restrictions. So the information that we have um, produced in our report and, and, and discussing here is based on um, what we found online and through discussions with palm oil traders. Um, I'd be very happy to receive any feedback if people have more information or believe some of it's not accurate. Um, and I, again, this is very much focused on Indonesia and Malaysia. It might be different in other markets. Uh, next slide. So spot market transactions can just be business to business, one time purchases. Um, refineries and area managers, if they um, need a bit of extra stock, will often just reach out to companies in the same area to purchase some palm oil. Um, it can just be a one time purchase and it, it can often just depend on the location of the mill versus the refinery, like how far it would have to travel, the cost, the reputation of the company, the perceived reliability or quality of their product. Um, we heard that it can also just be based on the personal relationship of the refinery manager. You know, if you're working in a refinery, you need some something quickly and you know someone that might have some surplus stock, you can just call them um, and get the stock that you need. We also know that um, refiners are often approached by millers in the area that, that are just selling their 
their um, stock on a one-time basis and they might just decide if they need it um, to take that stock. And that it, dep it depends obviously on the corporate structure of the company and how the teams relate to each other, but often that decision will be made independent of the sustainability team um, and there won't always be communication between the teams. Uh, next slide. Um, purchases can be from bulking stations. Bulking stations are usually located at refineries or ports. Um, all refineries will have bulking stations where they keep their products. Um, millers can rent these bulking stations sometimes or they can sell their CPO to the station um, and it can be added to a mix. Um, refiners either directly or via agents can approach bulking stations and make one-off purchases um, and in some cases the, the bulking station will you know they'll have their mix and they'll just um, sell it through tenders at the ports and if you're there and you need some extra stock you can just take it if you need it uh, next slide uh, palm oil auctions is another one that that came up um, in Indonesia. They often take place at major urban centres, um, particularly Jakarta and Medan, and also at some of the ports. Um, everyone knows how auctions work. The the palm oil producer will just list their their product for sale, and buyers can place bids. Um, most information I could find about auctions indicates it's more of a futures market mechanism your trade contracts more than the physical product. But um, I do know of some instances where it, it does um, refer to the physical product um, and it will often happen at port. So a shipment is on its way and um, buyers will sort of list their um, product and there'll be like an auction type scenario where people can bid um, for the shipment that's coming in and then take it when it arrives. Uh, next slide. And there's also just traditional, you know, buying a shipment from a trader or a broker. This was um, the, particularly the mechanism that came up when we were talking about the European market. Um, when you talk about the trade into Europe, you'll often hear the term SIF Rotterdam being used. SIF refers to cost insurance and freight contracts, which are contracts where um, all the, extra costs of a shipment like the insurance the tax everything the the sh um freight costs are included in the the price and rotterdam refers to the big rotterdam and a port in the netherlands um and sometimes they're like a european refiner will um make a purchase through from a trader or a broker they will usually know who the trader is that they're buying from um they will get that shipment um, the purchase will usually be direct, but the supply can often be mixed at the port of origin from multiple sources, or it can be mixed along the way. Um, and then the, the company buying will just get the shipment from the trader, and then at the same time, they'll get the list of suppliers of that shipment. Uh, next slide. So those are some of the sort of the key logistics of the industry that was sort of highlighted to us um, and that's sort of given us more of an idea of how the market works and also sort of why it might be a threat to NDP compliance. Um, the main reason is that there's just a general lack of transparency in the spot market. Um, we don't know a huge amount about it, we don't know which companies are selling on it, we don't know the volumes. If Sime Darby had not made the decision to be quite transparent about their spot purchases, we wouldn't have had an example of a company that um, buys from the spot market, an NDP company, because NDP buyers generally do not um, give this information on their grievance lists or on their supply lists, and they don't, they don't offer it. So we don't know whether um, purchases or supplies going to an NDP trader are via long-term contract or spot purchases. Um, one of the things that was highlighted a lot um, was that when you buy on the spot market, you usually are not given any information about um, the source of the product you're buying. So if you often buy from a, a bulking station, you'll get the physical product and they'll give you the list of suppliers at the same time. If you buy for a, you know, just a shipment from a trader, the, the physical product will come in and you only get the 
um, list of suppliers when it arrives. So some of the traders said, look, we've tried to apply due diligence to spot market purchases, but it's, we're hampered by the fact that nobody gives us the information we need. Now, I don't know whether that's just, that's just the way it is in the spot market, like it's a culture or a tradition of, that it operates that way, or whether there are logistical issues with the, you know, moving shipments from country to country that sort of make it difficult to give that information up front. But that's the sort of situation that has been presented to us. Um, if you look at the way the, the palm oil market works and the way that people have used their purchasing power to um, encourage suppliers to adopt policies, the very nature of a one-off transaction removes any incentive for the supplier to comply with NDP. If you, um, you know, if you're a supplier, someone comes to you and and wants to buy your product, they've never, you never met them before, never had any interaction, and you might never see them again, there's no real incentive to listen to what they're saying, because you can probably find another buyer somewhere else. Um, and in the case of Palmer Sarasi, you know, if a company is clearing forest, and they've been suspended by the NDP market, but they're still finding a way in, as they are, you know, with Stan Darby, um, why you know why incur the costs and the hassle of of doing all the things you have to do to be NDP compliant if you can still make a lot of money via the spot market, and and if that is happening um, a lot, and the sort of Palmer Sarasi case isn't an isolated incident, then that sort of undercuts the whole um, strategy of the palm oil sustainability drive. Um, so they're sort of the key sustainability and like NDP compliance threats that we identified during this research. Uh, next slide. Um, and then that sort of brings up the question of sort of how do you deal with this then and, and how do you deal with the sort of market access risks? I mean, buyers are under increasing pressure to ensure that due diligence is, is conducted on all their suppliers long-term contracts or spot market purchases. So if a company decides to buy spot purchases, they, ha they have to find a way to conduct due diligence. Um, if they can't do that, the solution might be to just not buy spot purchases at all. Um, and then you risk, you know, on occasions when you're, there's a shortfall or you're below capacity in your refinery, just making a decision not to fill that um, and deal with the associated economic losses. Because if a company can't, um, you know, can't apply due diligence and can't make sure that a spot market purchase doesn't have deforestation linked palm oil in the supply base, then they will face market access risk you know, that we're all aware of. You know, they might be suspended by their buyers, they might face um, supply chain suspensions themselves. Um, issues with finance if they're publicly linked to deforestation. So all sort of risks that companies are taking because this market does seem to operate outside of NDP. Um, and yeah, that's that's sort of the the main takeaway that we we have from our research that I wanted to share with you today. And um, I think there's some questions that we'll try and answer now from from people. But um, thank you for your time. the Q&A. So um, we have a few questions here. Uh, the first one, um, so besides the incentive of a uh, supplier to sell in the spot market so as not to be scrutinized regarding its NDP commitments and practices, what is the incentive, incentive of buying in the spot market, knowing that there is a less, there, that there's less transparency? I think it's just because if you have a shortfall of anything, you want to plug that gap. Um, during, I had a discussion with a trader and they said like if you're a cafe owner and you run out of pineapple juice you just run to the nearest shop and get some pineapple juice and it's really not that different if you've if you've underestimated the supply or the capacity of your refinery and you need to fill it you're just going to try and get the nearest stock that you can so that your refinery is running at capacity and you're not losing money um, and that's all it is and, and during the discussion about you know could you just make a decision not to buy spot they, could, they said yes we could but that presents risks because we need to make sure our refineries are, are running at capacity and um and that's why they do it it's just to plug a gap hope that's clear enough yeah uh 
Thanks for that, Chris. Um, another question about um, NDPE. So if non-compliance of NDPE policy creates automatic default, doesn't that marginal marginalize producers? And to whom would they send, be able to sell their yields to? Um, well, I mean, that you want producers to be NDP compliant. Um, so you would hope that there isn't a market for non-compliant palm oil to be sold into because you want um, the whole industry to be um, to be adopting these policies and to be operating on a level playing field. You know, some growers have made that decision to do that and they're incurring the cost of that and their buyers are also sharing the cost of that. Um, and the fact that some growers are not able to do that and are still finding a market is a massive issue. So uh, from our perspective, we wouldn't want there to be a market for them. We want that market to be closed because we want um, all growers to be, um, you know, not linked to deforestation or peak clearance and to be NDP compliant. And if they have in the past, there's a question at the moment about do they have to compensate? And if they do, how do they compensate? Okay, great. Uh, thanks for that, Chris. Uh, I'm going to put a couple questions to you at, w at once. Um, you talked, we talked to, at the beginning about how NDP has uh, transformed the palm oil market. Are there any statistics about how, about the impact of NDP, say like uh, regarding um, deforestation rates that could be real, realistically associated with NDP? And the other question, uh, the follow-up to that is what are possible adaptions um, from the approach learned in the palm oil supply chain that other deforestation linked commodities like soy and cattle can learn from palm oil? Um, thanks, the first question, um, we have case, cases of areas of forest that have been conserved as a result of the work that um, buyers have done to encourage um, companies to stop deforestation or to, to adopt HCS. Um, we also know from our monitoring of deforestation that it is reducing for palm oil in parts and we publish that every six months on the chain reaction research website. Um, there are obviously lots of variables and it's not always possible to link it to um, one specific company or, or the policies um, because there are there's also government you know moratoria government action there's certification schemes that obviously play a part um but so we have tried to sort of show evidence of it of it working but it tends to be more localized cases where we can link um an area of forest um to the actions of a of a of a company um, where they've made the decision to stop buying. And you can often, and if you want to do your own research, you can often see these on um, the grievance lists of, of uh, the traders because they will often put these success stories on there as well as some of the, the less successful stories. Um, and in the second case, I don't know specifically about Latin America because I don't work in, in the, that area or, or commodities. Um, you, uh, whoever asked that question, I can get their email afterwards and I can introduce them to my colleagues in Amsterdam who work in those geographical areas. We are looking specifically into other Indonesian commodities at the moment, um, particularly the industrial tree um, plantation commodities, so rubber, pulp and paper, timber products. We're just starting that research, so we don't know um, whether it works in the same way. What we what we do know is that the palm oil industry was um, sort of perfect for these NDP policies because um, a few companies dominate the refining and trading sector. So because there's not that many of them, if you get those companies to, um, to apply a policy, it has such a massive knock-on effect. And you saw that, like Wilmer adopted this policy and it just had such a huge impact because Wilmer is so big. Um, and then the other traders follow and, and so much of the market's covered. We do know that with, um, there's a debate at the moment about whether palm oil NDP policies should be extended to other commodities when palm oil companies are deforesting for other commodities. So there's a case at the moment in, in Sarawak in Malaysia where a company is clearing for a, log a logging concession for pulp and paper and they supply to palm oil companies because they also have palm oil concessions and then um, NGOs have been discussing with various buyers about extending the scope of their policies 
because you know if you have a no deforestation policy it shouldn't really be commodity specific it should be across the board so that's a possible way that the ndp policies of palm oil could have an impact on um other commodities but in terms of like specific supply chains of commodities we're only just starting to look into them and i don't know enough to sort of say conclusively that um you could apply what happened in the palm oil sector to pulp and paper because it's slightly different like we all know in indonesia the pulp and paper is dominated by two companies um so it's a slightly different approach that you'd have to take Great. Uh, thanks, Chris. Next question is, are there any examples of end user companies successfully combating spot purchases practices at their direct suppliers, such as big traders? And what would be the best way to de-risk de supply chains aside from prohibitive practices with uh, direct suppliers? Um, I don't know. The first, I don't know enough about the spot market. There's not enough transparency about it. I would love to talk to anyone about the spot market and if any companies you're willing to talk about their experiences with spot purchases, that would be really great because we just don't know enough. Um, and sorry, the second part of the question was how do you delink? Sorry, Matt, I didn't hear the second part. Yeah, sorry. Uh, de-risking supply chains is how. What's the best way to de-risk a supply uh, a company supply chain aside from prohibitive practices with uh, direct suppliers? Um, there needs to be a, 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 a what do you call it, multi-stakeholder approach. I forget the RSPO have been using this term, like shared responsibility. So there has to be um, a discussion about um, how you can encourage companies to be compliant without excluding them. Because you know, excluding companies is all, all well and good, but it, as soon as you exclude them, you lose all um, sort of influence over them. And that really has to be the last resort. And that's been a bit of an issue in Palm oil because the NGOs don't like it because, and it's also partly because of the companies because they weren't proactive enough. And often a deforesting company stayed in supply chains for so long and the, the company would always say, yeah, we're talking to them. And people got a bit fed up with it. But I think there needs to be more um, engagement and it needs to, to come from all sections of the supply chain so you can't just leave it of course the direct supplier will usually be the one that engages with the deforesting company because they have the personal relationship but in terms of like funding in terms of support it needs to come from the entire supply chain and that's where the end users and consumer goods companies are really key because there's, there's now this discussion about um compensation and and should companies pay for what for the for what they've done in, in the past few years. And if you believe they should, then it can't just be the growers that pay. They won't pay. We know they won't. Um, is, is it fair that it's just the traders? No, not really. So it has to be the entire supply chain. And that's the sort of discussion that's happening at the moment with some of the more proactive consumer goods companies coming on board. Uh Thanks, Chris. The next question is along the same lines. Is there an opportunity to support the development of some sort of standard supply chain reporting protocols to allow NDP to be managed through the spot market? Um, possibly. I don't know, really. because So I want to continue with research into the spot market because this I think we're just scratching the surface a bit. Um, and as I said, I don't know if the, is it, is it so um, untransparent just because that's the way it is? Or is, it, is there actually a reason why it's hard for, for um, people using the spot market not to provide a list of suppliers as soon as the purchase is made? I, that's what I'm not clear about yet. So I'm hoping that as we get more information, those sorts of solutions could be discussed. And, and again, happy to discuss these going forward. Okay, thanks, Chris. The next couple of questions deal with how much um, palm oil in the global market is traded in the spot market. What's the best way to identify the most active players? And do we have any idea of the total volumes of um, what's traded in the spot market or the total global percentage? Um, no, I tried. <laughs> I tried to, to get information, but no, it was too sensitive and companies wouldn't. Um, provide information about volumes. Um, as I said, like Sime Derby were the one that we really knew 
new to focus on because they're quite transparent about it. They said that the amount that they trade in spot market is is insignificant to them really. It's, it's below 1% of their annual volumes. And I think that it probably is in terms of global volumes pretty insignificant. It becomes significant when you look at companies like Sarasvanti and Palma Sarasi because if you're if your end goal is to stop deforestation, it, it might be insignificant for a big comp a big buyer, but it's obviously not insignificant for them, and it stops them um, doing what they should do. And um, and in the, in the meantime, for primary forest is being converted, and orangutans are being displaced. So um, I'd love to have more information about the volumes, but I also think it's important to always remember that it. It might be insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but on a local level, it's not insignificant. Um, and one other way that we can maybe identify companies active in the spot market is by accessing trade data. Because you can often see like something that looks a bit, um, not suspect, but if there's like a small like one-off purchase from the one company, you can maybe just assume that that's a spot purchase. Um, so we're going to look into that a bit more, but... Um, no, I, I would love for uh, uh, any company to be willing to provide more information on the spot market, but it, so far it hasn't been possible because people consider it sensitive information. Does the spot market require georeference pro uh, property locations uh, to make purchases? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know, to be honest. Okay. All right. Thanks. That was one question that came in. And... Um, the next question is, uh, when analyzing um, buyers and traders of palm oil, most of them do not have traceability to plantation for indirect suppliers. Why is this uh, difficult to implement? Um, I think traceability to plantation has always been difficult because it's very expensive and time consuming and companies have um, not, have, have, have been reluctant to spend or have only done it in certain geographical areas. Um, and there's always been this question of what do you do with the data that you amass? Um, particularly when it comes to smallholders, it's um, very difficult. And um, smallholders, uh, the market often changes. So you have to update the traceability to plantation data very, very often to keep it current. Um, yeah, it's, it's really important. Uh, chain reaction research and aid environment do our own sort of analysis of um, like sort of traceability to plantation when we suspect a mill is buying from a um, plantation that's clearing or has cleared or when we know a concession is involved in deforestation but doesn't have a mill, we try and work out where that um, concession is selling to. Um, but yeah, as far as I know, we don't have complete coverage or understanding of traceability to plantation because it's of the challenges of getting that information and, and companies not wanting to or not being able to invest at the pace that's needed. Is there a way of uh, determining how much of the marginal deforestation is driven by companies selling into the spot market? Um, no, not without more um, information on volumes and the companies that are um, that are using the spot market. You could do some local assessments based on some of the cases we know about, um, but not enough to to do a, like an Indonesia-wide study. I would need more information on volumes. In the case of companies that are making a large amount of their revenues from spot deals, do they then st store the oil? Of do they store the oil for this type of sales, or is it entirely uh, opportun opportunistic at us? certain point in time um yeah i've heard different things i've been told by um by a couple of people that some companies particularly in malaysia will will just store their um palm oil at ports in bulking facilities and wait for the the prices to be favorable and then offload it that way um it's i've just heard it's just industry gossip really so i don't know if it's true, I'm hoping that when COVID restrictions are lifted, we could go to the ports and do some investigations. I can imagine that's true. Um, you can't keep, like palm oil is, it does decline in quality the longer you keep it. So that's also a risky business strategy. So I imagine there's, there's more of um, a push to sort of offload it as quickly as possible. Um, we do know of some Indonesian companies that, that um, do 
approach refineries a lot and just off try and offload their CPO from the mill. So um, there's probably different companies take different approaches. And I, I think it's mainly opportunistic. Great, uh, thanks a lot, Chris. We're now at the end of the Q&A. So uh, first I wanna thank Chris for his presentation on this interesting but complicated topic. And thanks for everybody for tuning in today. As I mentioned earlier, we will have a recording up on the website. And um, if you wanna get in touch with Chris or any of us at Chain Reaction, our emails are on the screen now. So please uh, feel free to get in touch. Uh, thanks again for everybody for tuning in.